www.ebaycoaching.com. Um, I maintain and, and design this site, so anything you see that's wrong with it is entirely my fault. Uh, but it's a good place to go to get the latest version of Git for Windows or for Mac or something, get a download over that, or find some documentation. Uh, I, if you are working with somebody or if you're new to Git and you want to learn Git, uh, I have a website called gitrep.org that, uh, that takes all the different Git commands and puts them sort of in the sidebar over here and has a quick reference to any command to the useful shorthand stuff that, that you need to do to use Git. Um, and I wrote a book for APRESS that they let me create a Commons license, uh, which means it's open source, so you can read it online, you can download the, the markdown source for it. Uh, there's a translation in, uh, in simplified Chinese if anybody would like to help with the porting it over to the traditional, I, I would like to do that and put it online as well. Uh, there's a lot of translation support. My Twitter is Tricone. If anybody has questions, uh, I encourage you to ask me questions. If you uh, find any problems with Git or anything that I'm talking about or can't remember something, uh, please let me know. You can do that with that or with my email address at thatsfriendofgmail.com. So please do contact me if you have any questions about Git that, that you'd like some help with. Um, so, all right, that's more than enough about me. So, this talk, uh, I want to talk for a second about what Git is. So the point of the talk is just talking about how you can use Git to collaborate more easily. So to collaborate on open source projects or to collaborate with projects that you're working on um, a little bit more easily, hopefully, uh, than source control systems that you've used before or possibly that you're using uh, the way that you're using Git now. So first I want to talk about what Git is, uh, just at a lower level for a second, so we can think about it. Because a lot of people, how many of you use Subversion before you use Git. Almost everybody. There's, there's a lot of people that use Subversion or at least some centralized system before they use Git. And there's a lot of differences uh, between how Subversion thinks about version control and how Git thinks about version control. Um, so it's a distributed version control system. But what do we use version? What does version control mean? Right? What do we actually use version control tools for? So there's two main things that we use version control tools for. One is to collaborate with people. We use it to collaborate with people. And there are other tools that you can use to collaborate with people that suck. Uh, one is, is FTP. A lot of people will use FTP to collaborate with people, which is about the worst possible way that you can do that because you just FTP files over other people's files. Uh, but that's a common way. And another way, thing that we use version control for is for backup, to, to have some history of what our project looks like so we can go back in time for some reason or another. Um, and a lot of people will use, my mom uses a version control uh, tool for that, and it's called Copy. Right? So you take your directory and you recursively copy it into a directory with a timestamp on it or something so you remember what it looked like. That's probably the world's most common version control method. Uh, but those are the two things that we use it for. And uh, now most of us use Git or, or some other version control to, to do that, which is much better than using FTP for collaboration or using copy for backup. Uh, but you don't have to have it. Right? There, are, there was a world before version control tools um, and, and, and you can do these things without them fairly well. And in fact, um, there was a, a really big project that used no version control for a long, long time that most of you are probably running on your laptops right now. Um, and that is Linux, right? The Linux kernel did not use version control for the first decade or so, 12 years probably of its existence. Um, and yet it became very, very large, very big. It was very, uh, you know, the, the project did well enough. Um, but for 11 years it used no version control tool. So these are all of the releases of the Linux kernel uh, over the years. Um, and all of these releases were done with no version control tool at all. They didn't use Perforce, they didn't use Subversion or CBS at the time, which was, you know, around the 90s. Uh, they used nothing at all, right? So how did they do it? How, how do you manage a project with thousands of developers and all over the world distributed uh, without using a version control tool, right? So if you've done this, if you were in the open source world back in those days, um, this is how they did it. The main guy would take their project and they would have all of their files in their project and they'd zip them up and they'd put their, that tar, tar, tar them up or something, and they'd put that tarball on the server and they'd say, here's version one of the project. And then you, as a developer, would download that file, right, open it up and do a, a directory and say, this is version one, this is the known state of the project, and then you'd copy it, you'd copy that directory, that known state, into another directory, and you'd modify the files in that directory, right? In, in sort of some patch directory. You'd say, I want to change library.c, so you go in and you change it, and you add a feature or something. And then you want to share that, right? You want to get that incorporated back into the main project. And so what you'd use is you'd use a, a, a program called dip. Does anybody ever actually run dip? A couple people? Okay. So you'd use 
use them, and this would give you this, this dip, right? It would give you a difference between the known version of the project and the better version of the project, the, the, the feature of something you're adding. And then that is transferable over email very easily, right? And so you can take that and you can email a patch, this patch to somebody, and if they have the project in the known state that you downloaded from the server, then you can apply the, the maintainer could apply that and it would apply cleanly. And then they would create another version of it eventually. They put that on the server so you don't have to keep this sort of patched version around, right? So this is how the Linux kernel was basically handled. Is everybody would do this and they create patches and they send them to a mailing list and you'd have discussions on it. It's still how, you know, to some degree how, how it's, it's managed. But <coughs> maintaining this was very difficult. It's difficult on the people providing the patches because it's a lot of work to do. And it's difficult on the people maintaining the project, right? Because the patches get stale very easily. They don't apply cleanly anymore after a while. Uh, if 12 people send in patches, maybe the first five uh, work well and then the rest of them don't anymore because of the first five. So what Git is, was to make that process easier. And if you think about developing with that process, then Git is easier to understand. Does anybody still feel like they don't, they, they struggle with Git or they don't really understand Git that much? Maybe I won't. Does anybody feel really comfortable with Git? <laughs> okay. So, so maybe it's easier to think about Git in these terms, right? Because this is the problem set that Git was invented to solve, was, was this, right? Uh, so, so instead of the other one, what can happen now is that the main person can have their, their, their files and they can tell Git, I want to create a snapshot. So it's sort of like a tarball. It's a collection of files at a known state that is checksum, right? And, uh, and they say, I want to know, I want to remember the state. So you, they commit that and Git keeps that snapshot. And then when you clone, you get that snapshot as well, right? So it's not like Subversion where it's based on the files. What are all the versions of these files? It's based on these snapshots. What are all the snapshots that I have that you have had? And what comes before or after what other snapshots? And so what I would do is I modify something and I commit it and that's a new snapshot, right? It's a new known state of a project that's slightly different. And then the main person can keep working and then fetch in my snapshot. So they have a slightly different snapshot and I've done a slightly different snapshot. And then Git makes it easy to merge those snapshots together. So instead of actually having to transfer patches, you can transfer these snapshots back and forth and Git remembers where you are and what came before what and how to intelligently merge them together. So you don't actually have to use the diff files, uh, the patch files anymore if you don't want to, but you get the same sort of workflow. Um, and having, thinking about Git as a snapshot storage mechanism is really helpful because um, it's very different than version control systems before. If you've been using any version control for the last decade before Git, Every single one, basically, uses this, uh, this type, this subversion type way. Mercurial still does this, RCS, before CBS. They all think about version control in this way. They think about it in, in, from the point of view of the files. So you have a couple of files, let's say, and you add them to subversion. And what subversion will do, or any of the centralized systems, is they'll create logs for each file. Right? So they'll say, OK, you have two files, so I'm going to create two different logs a readme log and a hello log. And every time you change one of the files, I'm going to put a new version in that log. So I know which version each file is at. So uh, if I modify one of the files and I commit it again, then it modifies the hello.c log to say now there's version 2 of hello.c, right, right here. So there's version 1 and version 2. And it saves it as a div, so it saves a little bit of space and stuff. If you rename something, then that's sort of weird because since it's the logs are based on the file name, if you rename a file, it has to create a new log, right? It has to have a whole lot of C log. Um, and then it points back to the old one. So this is actually version one of whole lot of C, but really it's sort of version three of whole lot of C. It's just that you've changed the file name, right? So it has to have a pointer back. And then if you do a file copy, so if we copy whole lot of C to whole lot of C and we commit it again, well then it, now it's version three of whole lot of C, but it was sort of copied off of whole lot of C, so it has to have a pointer back. So as you're renaming files and moving files around, this file-based log system becomes sort of complex because it has to have these pointers going back and forth. And it's, it's difficult. And then to recreate a snapshot, to say what did commit C look like, you have to sort of follow that line. It's version one of readme.txt, uh, there is no hello.c in version one of hola.c. And in order to recreate what hola.c looks like, you have to go back into hello.c log and, and add up all the disks and you know, get a snapshot, right? So it's sort of convoluted. Uh, Git is the opposite of this. So it does the exact 
exact, sort of the exact opposite of this process, where the other process has all of these log files of all the, uh, of all the different files you have and can recreate a snapshot. Git does it the opposite, where it keeps all the snapshots and you can sort of, from all the snapshots, recreate how the files have changed, right? And so, if we take the same scenario where we have these two files, and when you run git add, in the other, in, in Subversion, when you're saying SVN add, um, what, so what you're telling Subversion is, I want to add this file, I want to add a log for this file, right? I want to, I want to create a log for this file and start tracking it. When you tell git add, you're saying, I want to add this content into my database. So what git will do is, it will check some the content that you have, and it will put the content into a key value store where the key is the checksum of the content and then the value is the content itself, right? So if we say git add readme.txt, it will checksum it and put it into its database and then give you a checksum back. And then anytime you ask git as a key value store, you say, hey git, what is the value for C3D, blah, 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 it will give you back that content. So it's a key value store, right? And if you say git add hello.c, it'll put that content into the database just the content, not the file name, not anything else. Just the content of the file. I'll put that in the database and give you a key back. That's, that's also a checksum. Uh, and then, when you say commit, what it will do is put in a, a, a snapshot, a manifest. It says, here's a list of all the files you have in your project. This right here, right? Here's a list of all the files you have in your project, and here are the checksums, the keys. This is how to pull them out of the database. Is anybody familiar with, uh, with, with POSIX file system standards? Right, this is similar to a POSIX file system. This is, this is a directory listing with block pointers, right? just like you would have with a, a disk format. And then if you change this, you change the content of below.c, and you add it, Git hasn't seen that content before. The checksum is different, so it puts brand new content in. Even though it's only maybe one line different, it sees it as different content, not a different version of the same file. It sees it as brand new content that hasn't seen before. It puts the value in its database and gives you a, a back as a checksum. And then it, it gives you a new snapshot where it reuses this block pointer because readme hasn't changed, but it gives you a different block pointer for this other file because the content changed. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Um, so these ones are different. That's, that's how you tell, right? You don't have a log from hello.c where you say it's version 1 and version 2. You look through the commits and say, what checksums have changed in between commits because those are the files that got modified. Right? And then if we rename this file and we commit, it doesn't see any new content because it doesn't care about the file names. All it does is give you a new manifest with the same block pointer, right? but just with a different file name. So when you check it out, it just puts the same content under a different file name. Uh, again, there's no metadata. Git does not, even though this is a file rename, Git does not store a pointer that says hello.c was renamed to ola.c. It doesn't care. What Git does is looks through your history and says, hello.c disappeared in between these two commits and hello.c appeared and they are very similar. So it was probably a reading, right? It doesn't explicitly say this file was renamed. It figures it out uh, heuristically. So if we copy the file like we did before, again, it will put new content in there. Um, and you can see it's just reusing this block pointer. So it's like a hard link in, in POSIX, right? It just, it says, I already have that, that content on the, on the disk here, so I'm just going to hard link the file. So they're both using the same block pointer. I don't have to waste space by having the same content in two different places. So this is what Git does, right? It, it keeps a linked list of snapshots of what the project has looked like, and then it figures everything out based on that. Is that clear? Does that make sense? Uh, so these are, these are, this is the difference between Subversion on the bottom and Git on the top. I think that Git is a much cleaner style. It's a much cleaner uh, 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 model than, than the Subversion model. And so it's, it's interesting to, to do stuff with it. But, but that's what Git does. So you can think of, of every time you run Git commit, you're creating a snapshot of your project. Right? Not, not new versions of your files, you're just simply creating a snapshot of what your project looks like right then. So you can share it with people. Um, however, the other interesting thing that it does is that when you do that snapshot, the commit data, it, it has a pointer to the manifest, but it also has a pointer to the commit it was based on, the one that came directly before, what was checked out in your working directory when you started working. 
And so from those two pieces of data, you can get a div off of those, right? If you take the snapshot that your commit points do and the snapshot that the, the parent, the one that it points to, then you directly compare them, you can get a difference, which is the logical change. It's a change set, right? So that commit, even though it's pointing to a snapshot, also represents a change set, some difference that you've made. And the commit message that's encoded in this commit that says, I changed this thing, that is, that is annotating the difference between what you started with and what you ended up with. Right? Even though that diff is not actually stored in the database anywhere, it can always be figured out by looking at the snapshot you recorded and the one you based it on. Um, so you can think about commits in both ways. It's both a snapshot, because that's how it stores it, and as a change set, because you have that data. You can compare it to what you had started with, and that's what the message is saying. I changed this thing, I added this thing. If you take the exact same commit, right? so commit E is pointing at this snapshot is exactly the same as this snapshot, the only difference is the parent, right? If you say the parent is this rather than the parent is this, then the difference, the, the diff is different, right? So the message wouldn't make sense anymore. So the message annotates what the, what the change has been. So you can think about commits in both ways, and we'll look at them in both ways. Um, but uh, when you're contributing with Git, there's a couple of tips that I'd like to share with you real fast. Some things that'll help you out. Um, if you're, this is an open source conference, so I assume everyone in this room should. How many, how many of you, have an open source project that you maintain, that you pull in patches from, that you are the maintainer for. Okay, so since this is a uh, uh, this is a classroom setting and we're in a university, I'm going to give you homework. Uh, you will be graded on this. Uh, so for, for everybody that isn't a maintainer of an open source project, what I'd like you to do tonight is I'd like you to go home and look on your laptop and find some piece of software any piece of software at all that is generic in some way, right? That does not have business logic in it for your particular business. Uh, that is generic in some way that you think it, just about anybody could conceivably use, no matter how bad it is, no matter how crappy it is, and put it in Git and put it on GitHub or put it, you know, on your own server or however you share code. But open source something, right? Even if you don't think anybody's going to use it, open source something because the open source community is very important to all of us, to all of our, our livelihoods and. So take something and become a maintainer of at least one project. It's good for you and it's good for the, the community. That's your homework and you will be great about it. Uh, okay, so when you're contributing to somebody else's open source project though, there's some things that you want to do. And this is good for you because it will make it more likely that your change will be accepted and you won't have to maintain it. Um, and it's good for the maintainer because it makes them like you more, because it makes their job easier. So this is some things to do. When you're working with Git and you want to contribute to an open source project, one is before you commit, check your difference for white space. Right? Whatever changes you've made, check it for white space uh, beforehand. And it gives you nice tools to do this. You can say git dash 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 check, and it will give you a, a color-coded output that says it says red when you have trailing white space uh, that is that is unnecessary. Right? And so you can go through and make sure that you're not introducing trailing white space that you didn't mean to do that. Get, 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 so run this before you run a commit on any of your open source projects so that you're not introducing uh, bad trailing white space. The other thing is don't do three or four, if you're going to send, if you're working on an open source project and you want to contribute your changes back and you've worked on three or four things, right, you did some typo changes or some documentation changes and you added a feature or something and they were unrelated, make them two separate commits, right? Don't just work on a whole bunch of stuff, get it done, and then do one big commit, and then send that big commit in, or some pull request for it. You want to separate your commits into logically separate change sets, because in the end, the last snapshot, the, the snapshot that your branch is pointing to when you push, that's the important one. That's the one that's going to be merged in. It doesn't matter what the history looks like on how you get there. So you might as well split it up into several commits that are logically separate change sets, so that it makes it easy for people to peer review what you've done, to look at it in, in context, one after another, instead of, here's a whole bunch of stuff that I can. Uh, and Git has tools to make this very easy as well. You can run git add dash dash patch. Has anybody used this before? Git add dash p or git add dash i will do this as well. Uh, what this does is it allows you to stage parts of changes that you've made in your working directory. So if you've modified, if you've added some comments at the top of a file, um, and some business logic changes if you modify a function or something later on, 
and you want to make them two separate commits, even though they're in the same file, you can use git to do this very easily. You can say git add add dash patch, and it will prompt you with each diff comp. So it will give you one diff comp and say, do you want to stage this? And you can say yes or no, and then the next one, and then the next one. And you can say, I want to stage these changes and not these changes. And then once you've done, once you're done, you say git commit. That will commit just the stuff you've changed, you you staged, and not not the rest of the stuff. So you can split up your commits. Um, the GUIs will do this uh, probably easier than the command line stuff, even though the command line stuff is nice. Git GUI, if anybody's run this, if you just type git space GUI and launch it, uh, it's a tickle TK program that's on, that's distributed with all the versions of Git, it's cross-platform, it works everywhere uh, equally. It has a very nice staging interface. So you can say, for this file, uh, I want to stage this hunk, and it will just stage these three lines and not, not the rest of the file, all right? So you don't have to just stage the whole file. Uh, and you can even do it line by line, stage one line of, of a change and not the rest of it. So it's actually very, very nice. It's easy to do that. Most of the GUIs have something like this. This is Git Tower. You can see stage this chunk on the side over there. Uh, it doesn't do line by line, but a lot of them will. So, so do that, right? Once you've done a bunch of work, don't just do one big commit. Craft it. Make, make nice commits that make sense as standalone units um, and make the commit messages make sense. This is why you should pull this change and this is why this change is necessary. Um, and that's the other part is make a helpful commit message. So this is the sort of format for a helpful commit message. You do one line, one short line summary so that if somebody runs git log dash dash one line, they get a summary of everything that, that you know has been done. Uh, one, one line per. So this is the summary of what you've done. And then do a more detailed text on why this change is necessary, why you should pull it in, why you did it, um, how you, you know, implemented it. This should be sort of mini documentation for the change that you're trying to introduce. So if you follow these, this, that's, never mind. Um, if you follow these uh, rules, it makes it easier for maintainers to pull in your changes, and it makes you more beloved by the maintainer uh, and more likely to pull in your changes. And then the last thing is, Keep changes on separate topic branches. So how many people use topic branches or use branching? Okay. If you're using Git, you really should be using branching because it's amazing. Uh, if you are afraid of the word branch, it's probably because you used them when, they were, when you were using Subversion. Um, and you should probably forget about what branches mean in Subversion and try and play around with branches in Git because it's a really, really powerful tool. And along the lines of keep your commits as logically separate changes, you should be keeping each series in a different branch. So each feature that you're working on or each issue that you're working on, keep it in a separate branch. Don't work on one thing and then work on another thing right after it. Branch off of the known master branch that the maintainer is using and do different uh, topic branches off of that solving different problems and send them different pull requests for each one, right? So that if they decide not to make merge in one of them, they can still merge in the other one without trying to split up your, your, your commit stream, right? Um, so doing that is, is very easy for you and, and, and easier for them. Okay, so uh, here's my, this is my guide to making proper commits. Check for white space, uh, do logically separate change sets, do helpful commit messages, and do one topic uh, per branch, or one, one branch per logical topic that you're working with, and send pull requests off of those. And if you do that, then uh, your maintainers will like you better. Um, okay, so a couple different workflows I'm just gonna go through. Uh, that you can use to collaborate with Git, that you can use to contribute with Git. You can still use Git in the centralized model, the same way that you use Subversion, right? You, a lot of people think you can't do this um, for some reason, or, or think you can only do this. It depends on, on where you're coming from, but you can still have one shared repository and give everybody right access that you want, and have everybody push pull to that. This is very common in corporations, um, but, uh, but that's doable, right? You can do it the same, same way that, that uh, Subversion does it, basically. Um, and the, the difference is, it's first come, first serve. So in Subversion, it was like this um, on, on file, right? If two people edited the same file, the first person that pushed, or the, the committed, I forget the terminology in Subversion sometimes, the first person that committed, that change gets in. The second person that committed, they don't get in, right? They have to, they have to update and merge, do manual merge on, uh, locally and stuff. Uh, but I get it's not just a file, it's the whole thing. The first person that pushes, even if it's a different file, wins. The second person has to pull that down and merge. And the reason why is because of this. This is what the server does when you're pushing and pulling. Um, so if you have a Git repository that has two commits, so these are your, your two commits, right? One commit, and then you did a second commit. This is where your master branch is. Um, and you, this is on your server, 
and two people want to make a change. Want to add each two people want to add different features. So you clone it, get clone the URL, and then you get a, the same objects, the same database on your local computer, right? So get or, so Nick gets a, a copy of this computer, and you get a, a pointer that says where the last known point of that master branch was of all the branches on the server that you clone from, right? And when you clone, it automatically makes the server you clone from origin, which is why you see origin slash master. That means the master branch on the server that you clone it from, right? It's the last known point of that. And then you get your own branch so you can work on it. And then Scott does the same thing. Scott clones down uh, the same database. And then they both work, right? So Scott does a couple of commits implementing feature. Nick does a couple of commits implementing feature. And now they want to collab they want to collaborate. They want to share those changes and merge them together, right? So this is what the Git server communication protocol looks like. Um, you run Git push to share your changes. And what Git push does is it basically says, tell the server that I want its branch, whatever branch name, usually like master or, or some top of branch, I want its branch to now be the same point that my branch is. Right? I wanted to point to the exact same object, the, the same commit uh, snapshot. Um, so the first person that runs it is fine. You say git push, and then you say the server you want to push to. You can put the URL in, but it's usually easier if you have a, an alias, which, you, which clone sets up for you. So you say git push, the server you want to push to, and then the branch you want to push. And then the conversation between the client and the server goes like this. The client says, I want to push some new stuff. The server says, I have this branch at this pointing at this commit. And then the client walks from wherever he wants to push down the history, right? What walks all the parents and sees, can I find what's on the server in my history, right? And in this case, by walking through the parents, you can find it. You can see that commit in your history. And so, so it's cool, right? So then it'll just take whatever the difference is, transfer it up to the server, and then once that's all completed, it moves the branch on the server. So now the master branch of the server is pointing to the same commit that the master branch on the person who pushed it. Does that make sense? So now when Nick wants to push, he wants to push this feature too, right? So the second person that pushes, um, the, community, or the, the protocol basically does the same thing. They run the same command. The, the, the client says, I want to push some stuff. The server says, I've got master at you know, this particular commit. And then uh, Nick says, I'm not familiar with that, right? If you walk down the history of, of, from what you're trying to push, you can't see that commit anywhere in your history, right, by, by walking through the history. And so that means it's not incorporated. And since the command says, I want to make your master branch my master branch, if you did that, which you can with the dash f, you can force push, what, what it does is it basically moves it up and just moves the master branch, and what you've done is you've abandoned the changes that were pushed by the previous person, right? And so that's me, right? It's, it would be mean of you to do this because it's just saying, I don't care what Scott pushed, I just want my master branch to be the master branch now. And that's not nice, and then Scott doesn't like you, and then you get into fights. So, so what, uh, what you have to do is you have to make the commit on the server, in your, you have to put it in your history. And the way that you do that is you fetch that down, and then you merge it so that it's now in your history, right? So you run git fetch, uh, git fetch origin. And it will pull down the objects you don't have yet, and it will move the origin slash master branch so you know where the master branch of the server is. And then you can do a merge, right? I want to merge the master branch of the server into my master branch, and it will merge it. And then when you try and push again, uh, the same conversation happens, right? OK, I want to push some stuff. I've got master with this. I can see that now, right? If I walk through my parents, I can now see that in my history. So it's cool. Now you can push, right? And so it takes the difference, moves the objects that aren't already there up, and then once that's done, move the master branch. So that's the communication that happens. Um, when you get that, that the, the non fast forward rejected, I'm sure everybody's probably got this at some point, you want to get pushed, it says rejected, it would be a non fast forward merge. That's what it means. It means that somebody is pushed in the meantime, and I can't find it in your history, right? So if I try to, if I try to fast forward that branch, I can't do it. And so if you, if you force the push, then it would, it would be losing something on the server. So th that's why you get that message. Uh, okay, so uh, if you want to push another branch, though, if you want to push a branch that doesn't exist yet, Git doesn't care. The server doesn't care. Because all you're saying is, I want my branch to be a branch on that, the same name branch on that server. Uh, as long as you're not overwriting something, you're not losing data, Git doesn't care. So if you have another branch that goes off in a different direction, and you say, git push origin, sum on the branch, 
then the server doesn't really care, right? Because you say, I want to push the stuff, it says, I've got master, and the client says, I don't care because I'm not trying to push the master, so I'm not overriding anything. I'm not in danger of overriding anything. So uh, I'm just going to give you the difference and create a new branch for the server. And then when Nick fetches, they'll get those objects and get a origin slash whatever that branch name is, right? Whatever branches are on the server, they don't have yet. Um, so that's, <coughs> that's how you collaborate uh, in Git. Um, so, does anybody use Rebase? A couple of, oh, geez, everybody. Okay, I'll go through this kind of fast then. Because uh, you all are experts in Rebase. So, one of the nice things about Rebase is if you're using topic branches, like I was talking about before, to isolate series of, of changes, um, Rebase can be fairly nice, right? If, if you're trying to, especially if you're trying to uh, submit a, a, mail, a, a series to a mailing list. And the reason why Rebase exists is for that reason, right? Uh, if you're using GitHub or something, I would say never use Rebase because it's, it's basically, it's rarely that helpful. Uh, because everybody's used to pulling and merging and not necessarily taking, having to, to code commits over mail, over email, which is why Rebase exists. So why Rebase exists is if you have this topic branch and you want to make it up to date with your master branch, make sure that it's, it's up to date with your master branch, and you're on the topic branch, you have it checked out, and you say git merge master, then that will merge into work in the master branch. Your topic branch is updated. Your master branch isn't touched. And now your topic branch has the master branch work as well, right? So it's up to date. So that's fine. Uh, if you want to send it over a mailing list, though, if you want to send your topic branch over a mailing list, you can't do this because you can't mail a merge, right? And so what you need is you need just those two commits to be patches, and you need to be able to send them over a mailing list. So what you do is you, you do rebase. And what rebase does is you say, give me the one you're on, so you're on topic right now. You say, get rebase master. It says, okay, here's the, the one I'm going to rebase it onto. And then it finds the first common commit. So it walks through the history of both lines, finds the first commit in common, which is probably where you created the topic branch in the first place. Uh, and then it takes everything between that and the one you're on, so, so your side of it, whatever's on, unique to the topic branch. And it creates patch files of each one. So it says, what's the difference between the last commit and the one before it? Gives you a patch file, puts it in a stack. Uh, what's the difference between the one before that and the one before that? Creates a patch file, puts it in a stack. And so now you have a patch queue, right? You have a little patch queue. Uh, and then it reapplies those patches in, in order on top of whatever branch you pull it So it, it tries to apply the first patch there, it tries to apply the second patch there, and then there's a top of So what you've essentially done is taken a little patch queue, a little patch series, and moved it, right? Try to reapply it somewhere else. So that's what, that's what Rebase does. And now you can mail those two commits over a mailing list, and they will, they're known to apply cleanly to the master range. So if they don't, the, the maintainer can push back on you and say, Rebase your series so that it applies cleanly. And now it's your job to do that, rather than the maintainer's job to try and fix the problems. So that's why Rebase exists. Some people like it because it gives you a linear history. Uh, but really, it's, it's just there to make it so that you can update a topic branch to, to re, resubmit to a mailing list. Um, so speaking of mailing lists, if you deal with a project that uses a mailing list, which tends to be the more hardcore ones, um, so the projects that use mailing lists are usually the projects that are maintained by people who like them up. Because um, they're the only people that can, that can do this well. Um, but uh, if you do, there's a couple of rules. Again, one clean branch per series because it makes it easier to extract a patch series out of it. Uh, then you extract the, the patch files, and then you mail those patch files to a mailing list. And Git has a very nice way of doing it. So uh, to create a clean series, you just rebase your whatever top branch you're on on top of Origin Master. That will take the difference, move it on to Origin Master, uh, make sure it's up to date. And then you can extract that branch, whatever's unique to the branch, to, to patch files that are inbox formatted easily. So if you're on your branch, and you say, format patch, and then the, 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 what you're trying to base it on, it'll take whatever's unique to your side, so in this case, the two commits, and it will put them into patch files um, that are named after the, the thing, and they look like emails. They're actually formatted like emails, so it's inbox formatted, right? Uh, so you have the from, which is taken from the author, and the date, which is when the, the commit was actually authored, and the, the subject, which is the first line of your commit message, and so on and so forth. And then it gives you a, a sort of little diff stat, so you, you can see what is sort of a summary of what's done. And you can edit that. So if you want to go in and put some, some message for the, the mailing list organizers that will not be reported in the commit, you can put 
put in there just to explain what you're doing that you don't want to preserve for posterity. And then it gives you the actual hash, the, the version of Git. But then that's an inbox format. So you can actually open that up and make a month or something and just send it, right? It will, it will work fine, which is kind of cool. So you do that, or you can set up uh, your .git config file with IMAP settings and then run a, a command called git send email. And it will actually send all the patches you give it as a, an email series, which is kind of nice. So if you want to work with an email series or an email server by, by supplying patches, format patch and send email to your friends. They're, they're very easy to use. Uh, OK. So now, uh, the, other, the other way of contributing that is more common now, right? mailing list used to be the way that most of the open source projects work. Now, uh, personal repositories are very common. So this is a more common paradigm now, where especially with sites like GitHub that are, that are becoming more popular, where it makes it very easy to get your own fork of a project that you have right access to, right? So it's more common now to have some less of a repository. Everybody makes a fork of it, pushes to their fork, and then sends a pull request back to the main repository, right? So for every developer, you actually have an extra repository on the internet somewhere rather than everybody. Like Subversion, you wouldn't do that, right? Subversion, everybody checks out from one main place, works on it, creates a patch file, and mails it off. There's no other good way of doing it without giving commit access to everybody. Right. This way, everyone has commit access only to their own and not to, and read access to everybody else's. Right? So it's, it's a lot safer. You don't have to figure out if people are trustworthy to give them a commit bit or not. Um, so this is the way that the objects work in this. If you have, if I have my, my repository here, I have a, a commit, I have one commit, that points to a tree, which is that, that manifest, right? the listing of files, um, and then two blocks, that's, that's, those are the file contents. So I have two files. Uh, and, and I've committed, I've done one commit on them, and these are the objects that Git has to, to maintain and push around. So if I create a repository on GitHub or something, and I push, now I have those same objects on GitHub, right? And I have a branch, public slash master, I named it public instead of origin on this just because it's, it's arbitrary. You don't, origin is not special the same way that, that master is not special. A project does not have to have an origin or a master branch. Uh, those are just the defaults that Git and Git, Git clone create for you. So uh, a, a, an example of a repository that does not have a master branch is the Perl repository. It has a, a branch called Bleed, I believe, uh, that and does not have a master branch at all. So if you check it out, that's the thing. So none of, neither of those are special. But so I have my master branch. I have a public master branch that, of where I last pushed, and then Nick clones from that and changes a file and does a commit. Right. So now he has two commits, an extra blob, extra manifest. Jessica clones the same repository, changes both files and does a commit. So now she has two new blobs, uh, two new blobs, a new tree, and a new commit, right? And then they go to GitHub, do a fork, so they have their own, their own writable versions, and they push their work to the fork, right? So now there's some duplicated objects on GitHub, but you guys don't care because you know it's not your this this space, right? So so uh, so now they email Nick, right? They email the or I'm sorry, they email the, the maintainer, the person that's maintaining the repository. They email them or they send them a pull request on GitHub or something. And they say, uh, here's some, pro so, some change, some feature that I've added. And then the maintainer can say, OK, I want to add Nick as a remote. <coughs> so that's cool. And I want to add Jess as a remote. So you add this big URL, so you don't have to remember the URL. You just alias it as Nick and Jess. And so you don't have to type the whole URL each time. And then the maintainer can say, git fetch Nick. And that will pull just the objects that Nick has included, that has introduced, down into your repository and give you a Nick slash master branch. And git fetch Jess, and it'll pull just the objects that Jess has introduced to give you a Jess slash master branch. And so now the maintainer has all of that work locally, and nobody had to have right access to my repository other than me, right? Which is kind of cool. Uh, and then they can, you can merge them together and push. And the interesting thing here is, is with the remote repository, your remote branches, you can tell where Nick's master branch is, where the last place that Nick, the last work that Nick pushed, right? Because you have a Nick slash master. You can see the last work that Jess pushed, because you have a Jess slash master. You can see the last time you pushed publicly, and you can see where uh, your current branch is, right? So all of those branches have meaning, and they're all useful to, to be able to see and, and do gifts and stuff like that. And then when you push, your public master moves up because you, you share it. And so now we can actually see. In this network, for the three people who work together, there's actually six repositories, right? Three local ones and three public ones. Uh, and you can see where, where Nick's objects have propagated throughout this network. 
You can see where Jessica's objects have propagated throughout this network, and you can see where my combination of them uh, has, has propagated so far. And the nice thing about this is it scales really well, and you don't have to give write access to everybody. So if there were, you know, 10 more developers, the cool thing is Nick doesn't have to know that Jessica exists, and Jessica doesn't have to know that Nick exists. I just have to know that they do, and I merge everything together, and then when Jess fetches, she gets Nick's changes, right? Even though she doesn't actually have to know that he exists or, or communicate with him in any way, which is kind of cool. Uh, so if you're doing things this way, uh, the, the general way of getting your changes incorporated into the maintainer is to send the maintainer a pull request, right? So how many of you have sent a pull request? Okay, I have another homework assignment. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, but it would be good. It would be good to, to, to go somewhere, fork a project, add some feature and send a pull request, try and get your, you know, try and contribute to an open source project. It makes you feel good inside. Um, so the way that you request a pull, or you, you request a pull, basically you tell a maintainer I have some work that you might want to incorporate. Um, you want to be a good citizen here as well to make it easier on you. So uh, you make your branch update, right? You do the, you rebase on top of order mess to make sure everything's up to date. It's a nice clean branch. Um, you push it to a named branch. This is really important because I get this all the time. I maintain a lot of open source projects. Um, if you're sending pull requests, do not send a pull request for your master branch, right? You work in a, in a named branch or at the very end, once you're done, create a, a, a named branch wherever you, you are and then push that named branch where the name of the branch is the, is, has something to do with the feature, right? If you're adding internationalization support or something, name the branch IETN or, or something like that. Don't say pull for my master branch. Because it's, it's confusing for, for the maintainer if they have a lot of pull requests. It's much easier if you can have a list of all of the branches uh, and, you know, on GitHub or whatever, and, and they're named after the feature you're actually trying to work in. So you push it to a named branch rather than a master branch of the server, and then you contact the author and say, here's where you can find this feature if you're interested in it. Uh, so this is, this is how it would go. Uh, if, you, if you forked a project and you cloned it and you worked on it and you, you edited something, what you want to do is you want to add the upstream. You want to add the, the maintainer's repository as well. So you have two remotes. You have one to the one you can push to, and you have one to the, the, the canonical repository. Uh, and then you fetch from that to make sure you're up to date. right? So now I have, there was some change. So now I have a new upstream master. You rebase uh, whatever you're working on on top of that upstream master. To, to make sure that you're up to date, right? So I just pulled down some, they did something since, the last, since I started working. I pulled that down, I rebased my work on top of that so it looks like I did my work on top of that, right? Rather than where I actually started. And then you push your branch, so if, if your, your branch name is my feature, you push my feature to the server so that it is now public and you can send the, the maintainer a pull request for your feature. If you name it my feature, you don't name it master. And this is what actually sort of happens, right? So you create a, a branch called my feature off of uh, the master branch, off of where we come from. You do some work, so my feature now has two new commits on it. Um, you fetch from upstream, so you get the new master branch, which has some other commits that have happened in the meantime. You rebase, which takes those two commits that you've done and moves them on top of upstream master instead of the, the original master. Uh, and then you push them up to the server and you contact the maintainer and say, here's a little patch series that is at the feature does something useful. Um, and there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, a common way in the olden days, which you can still do, um, this is if you're running your own Git server uh, for some reason. God help me. Uh, but if you're running your actual own server and your own hardware and you want to do that maintenance, um, what you can do is you can say get request pull, right? So uh, if you say get request pull and you say the, the branch, uh, that it's going to be based on, right? This is the, this is the branch, the, 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 the upstream branch. And then you say where the maintainer can find your work. So, so you put whatever your pushable URL is, um, or, or alias if you have one. Uh, then what Git will do is it will output the standard out a little summary that you can use as a mail head, or as a mail body, right? So it'll, it'll just sort of summarize, here's a list of the changes. So it has just a list of all of the different commits that you've done. Uh, here, right, this is the this is the commit you based it on. Uh, here's the URL where the person can find it. Uh, here's uh, what you've actually done and a diff stat so they can see, you know, what files have been changed and stuff. And then you can take that and just email the maintainer with that. It, it generates the whole email for you so you don't actually have to do it, which is kind of nice. And then the, per the, other, the maintainer can basically just say git pull and 
copy and paste that URL, they, they, they can pull your work in, right? Which is kind of nice. So uh, if you are a maintainer and you get one of these, there's two different ways you can accept that pull request as well. So, so let's say you get an email that looks like this, right? So here's the URL that, that, uh, that the, the feature's at, and here's the branch name of the feature that they want you to pull in. And you know, maybe someone you can edit, they'll edit that and say this is why I did this or something. Uh, you have two different options as a maintainer to pull that in at this point. One is if you think this person is going to continuously send you updates or has sent you several pull requests before, you can add them as a remote, so you have an alias for them, right? So, so in the future, you can just say get fetch Nick and, and pull down all the stuff that he's done rather than actually having to copy and paste the URL, right? So you can add them as a remote, so you can say your remote at Scott. Anytime I send you a pull request, you're probably going to want to add me as a remote because I'm... Um, but, uh, but you just say get at Scott and give it an alias, and then you can say get fetch Scott and it'll pull down everything that's on Scott's server, and then you can say get merge Scott side by feature or something to check it out. Um, like that, right? It'll merge it. So that's fine. And then in the future, if you get another pull request from Scott, you don't have to copy and paste the URL, you just say get fetch Scott. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, which is actually not very well documented, but I use it constantly, is you can do a one-time pull where you don't have to add them as a remote. Um, you can simply say get pull the URL and then the branch name, and it will it will fetch it down. It will add a, a thing called all caps fetch underscore head, um, which you don't really need to know about, but it, that's what it, that's what it's used to reference. Um, it, it, it will fetch it down, and it will immediately try and merge it into wherever you are. Right, so it doesn't much matter which branch you're on. Wherever, whatever you have to have checked out right now, it will fetch that down into fetch head. It will try and merge that into wherever you're done, and it will not keep it as a remote. Right, so you don't have to have if you have four or five remote people, you don't have to have a whole bunch of remote sitting around. You can simply do these one time. So those are your two options as a maintainer, um, and they're fairly easy. Okay, so. So then the final thing is GitHub. So if you're using GitHub, we have a pull request feature system to try and make this process easier. Um, so uh, if you create something on a top branch, you push the top branch up to the server, and you want to send a pull request to the maintainer that you forked it from, you switch to your top branch, and you actually have to switch to your to so that this says branch my feature, you know, whatever the feature branch is, and then you click the pull request button, and it gives you a little form, and it gives you a little uh, summary, right? So you're asking this person to pull two commits into their master branch from your feature branch. And just look at that, make sure it's, it's okay. It shows you all the people that are going to be emailed when you actually send this, which is the maintainer here. And you just type in why you're sending this pull request, what it's doing, you know, to give the, the author, the maintainer, an idea of what you're trying to introduce. Uh, and you can even, we'll, we'll do all this stuff like, uh, like give you the list of, of unique commits and the, the total difference, the unified dip of all of the, the commits put together so they can see what the total sort of patch is. Um, you can even, on, on this screen, you can even say, uh, the, on the URL, you can type dot .patch and we'll give you this as a file. So you can actually run like curl uh, that URL dot .patch and then type it through git am or something um, if you wanted to do that. But, uh, but anyway, so you, you fill all that out and then you send it and then people can comment on it and comment in line on, the, on each line of the, the div and everything. It's kind of cool. But, uh, but it makes the process a, a little bit easier than just sending a thing over email. But either way, it doesn't really matter, right? The point of Git is that you don't have to have a commit bit to, com to commit to a project. You push it to an A branch, you contact the author in some way. This makes it a little bit easier on the author, perhaps. Uh, you know, you have a conversation. You can do this in email as well, right? You can, send a patch to the, to the author and have a thread of email and, and do basically the same thing. Uh, this is just a prettier, easier way of doing it in, in some way. So, uh, so that's it. That's how you hopefully can, can become better Git contributors or, or reduce the frictions of, of contributing to open source projects or maintaining open source projects. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. I think I do I have any time for questions. I don't think it really is. Does, does anybody have a question? No. Oh, screw it. I'll get off the stage. Thank you. Oh, 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 I have stickers. Anybody wants a sticker?